Matthew 18 and verse 1. Verse 1 reads, At that time, the disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? This question is a question that has to do with power, that has to do with position, and the disciples wanted to know, where do I rank? Where do I stand? There are a few things I want to point out just in this verse before we move on. Notice Matthew uses the language, the kingdom of heaven. Whenever Jesus speaks, he says the kingdom of God. Matthew is a student of what Jesus is teaching. He's talking about children, but the core principle is about offenses. Don't bring offenses. And you notice in the text, it said, at that time. Well, what was that time? Jesus had just spoken to Peter about something that was troubling Peter, in a sense. Someone came to Peter and says, does your master not pay the temple tax? So they were trying to find fault. They're like, wait a minute. He's supposed to be this godly person. He's supposed to be a prophet. Does he not pay the temple tax? And Peter said, yes. Now, I don't know if Peter had ever saw him pay a temple tax or not, but you know what it's like when you're under pressure and somebody is trying to catch your friend in something? I guess Peter thought he was defending him. He said, yes. Jesus wasn't there. But Jesus had something that all believers have. The Spirit let him know before Peter got there. The Bible says in Matthew 17 that Jesus anticipated this. And so when Peter walked in the room, have you ever had a situation where God reveals something before it happens? When I was a new believer, that's how he taught me. I used to go to church in the morning, and I knew exactly what was going to be said. I knew the text, and I would get so sad. I was like a little child. I understand what it means to be like a child. I was like, whoa, this is unbelievable. And I'm like, I shouldn't say that. I'm a believer. What do I mean unbelievable? <laughs> but it's one of those things, and he kept doing it. And what I realize now as I look back is he was increasing my sensitivity to his voice and letting me know that when I tell you something, you can trust it. It's going to happen just like this. And this went on for months and months. So Peter walks in, and Jesus says, Simon, what do you think? The kings of this earth, do they take tribute from their sons or from strangers? Here's what I love about the master. We all need to learn from him. When he asks a question, the solution is in the question. Some people ask questions like the people who ask Peter to try to trip you up. Those are people who think they know everything. Those are people who are also dishonest. So don't be like that. Jesus had the solution in the question. And Peter said, strangers. Jesus said, yep. So I want you to take a hook. I want you to go down to the sea, cast it in, and you're going to get a fish. Open his mouth, there'll be a coin in there. Pay for me and for you. And he said, now, because the kings of this earth take it from strangers, the sons are free. In other words, princes don't pay taxes. And he's like, you're a citizen of the kingdom. You're free from this. You don't have to do this. I'm trying to tell you that you're free. But nevertheless, lest you offend them, go put that hook in the fish's mouth and do it. So the lesson Jesus was teaching is, don't be an offense. Offenses will come, but woe unto them who do it. Woe unto them who do it. So now we get to Matthew 18 and 1, and the question is asked, who is going to be greatest in this kingdom that's coming? Thy kingdom come, where am I going to rank? Matthew writes the kingdom of heaven because he doesn't feel worthy to write the name of God. The name of God is sacred. Write 
the name of God. So when you look at Matthew, he always refers, when it's in his voice, to the kingdom of heaven. When it's in the voice of Jesus, when it's in red, it's the kingdom of God. And the Lord is saying, there's some of us who are like Matthew. We remember what we were. And that holds us back from the fullness of God. We feel like we're not worthy of the things that God has because God is holy. But I want you to know that once he touches you, so are you. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter where you've come from. It doesn't matter what you've done. He makes it all right. He makes it all right. Tell your neighbor, you're all right. Because God says you're all right. So Matthew could not bear to write the name of God. He couldn't write Adonai. He couldn't write Yahweh. He couldn't write Elohim or Jehovah. So he wrote the kingdom of heaven. What's important to know is that it means the same thing. It means the same thing. So even if my language is muted, because I see myself as unworthy. The power that's in my tongue is no less. The power that's in my tongue is no less. So even when I'm spiritually hobbled, even when I see myself as a publican because the whole society tells you what you are, that you are the worst of the worst, the Lord will lift you up and he'll even take you in your hobble state and give you power. Somebody say amen. So Jesus responds to this question, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Verse 2, then Jesus called, somebody say called, a little child to him. I want you to know that he calls children. I want you to know that he calls children. Set him in the midst of them. He called the child to himself, and he set them in the midst of them. I want to say to every parent, Jesus calls the children to himself, but he sets the children in the midst of us, and he expects us to care for them. I want to say God gave me a word for every single. Often when we talk about family matters, it feels like we're excluding people who are single because just the word family means that it has a certain connotation. And if I'm single, it leaves me out of that. Well, I want you to know Jesus was single. Jesus had no children. He was single, he had no children. But he's the greatest child advocate that ever lived. There's none greater than him. So just because, not just because, you're single, you identify with him. He knows what it means to be single. He knows what it means to have no children. But when it was time to talk about the kingdom, he called the child. He called a child. And he set them, the child, in the midst of them to teach them. Imagine he uses a child as a teaching aid. He, He's different. He's different than most of us. Most of us use a child as someone who we want to shape and mold after our image and our likeness. But Jesus uses a child in this instance as a teaching aid. And he says, and said, assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Now remember, the question was about what is my position going to be? Jesus takes it back. If you're not like this child, you're not even going to enter. Don't worry about what you're going to be. You better worry about getting in. I'm trying to tell you how to get in. You're worried about your position. He reminded them, you still have work to do. You have work to do. So what is it about a child? In the next verse, he talks about humility. You need to humble yourself like a child. But there are other characteristics of a child. A child believes all things. That's the reason fairy tales are told to children. Because they will believe in the Easter Bunny and all those things. They believe things. There are some things that my parents and my grandmother, my grandparents told me to get me to do stuff. And I found out later it wasn't true. 
Sometimes I found out years later I was in college <laughs> because I believe what grandma said. Children believe all things. They're also curious. They're learners. They're learners. But ministers, Baldies, I've met some adults in my life who are so smart, they can't learn anymore. And for them, ex experience becomes the worst teacher because the lesson is learned before it's taught. Because when I think I know, I'm shut off to that. Because I know more than you, who are you to tell me? There's no one, there's no one who can't learn. That's why Jesus said humility is, you need to be like this child who believes all things, who's open, who's curious. But you get to a certain point and you say, do you understand my pedigree? You're a junkyard dog trying to talk to me. I'm a well manicured. Do you understand? But Jesus is saying, you need to come like a child. So then I thought about the children in my life. And I have two quick stories. Not long ago, little Olivia, my granddaughter, was with her nana. And they're in the car. And they're doing what they do, go to Costco and all these fun things. And the radio is playing, and Olivia protests. She says, Nana, no more church music. <laughs> it's a true story. In her mind, she's the boss. <laughs> no more church music. And, and Nana responds calmly, there will only be church music in this car. And then Kirk Franklin comes on. I don't want to love nobody like you. I don't want to love nobody but you. And you know what Olivia says? That's better. <laughs> so I thought about that. And, and I try to analyze the mind of a child. It wasn't church music that she was protesting. It was the expression of it. And through that child, God is teaching me how to do church better because he's saying it wasn't that. But when you take her back to the spirituals, she can't relate to that. Her little mom, she came out of the womb swiping. She knows more about their vices than her parents and her grand. It's natural to them. So when they're swiping and they're watching kids YouTube and you come with Pass me not, O oh gentle Savior. They're saying, no. But when you say, I don't want to love nobody but you. I don't want to love nobody but you. So I realized the expression of it is what responds to children, what children respond to. And not just children, young people. Before I get to my second story, I fell in love with Willie Moore Jr. yesterday. As we were in the back talking, we connected. We connected, and when he came out here, I noticed some things that would be taboo often, because sometimes I think Jesus brought them in the midst to teach them something, to say, don't get so caught up in tradition that you miss me. And don't put yourself already in a place that I haven't put you. You're talking about where you stand. You need to focus on entering in. And that's why he taught them about offenses, but Willie Moore was here, and he had on his, what kind of hat was that? A cool hat with a brim. I want, he never took it off. If you focused on his arms, he had tattoos. But I promise you, it didn't matter, because anybody who was in his presence knows that the Spirit of God is in him. He loves God, and he honors his parents. And I'm thinking, God, how many people look at the outside and they won't even hear him because they're focused on that? I say, shame on you if that's you. God, deliver us from that because we were so blessed. How many people were in the room yesterday? Was Willie Moe Jr. a blessing? He was a blessing. But here's the point. There are times when people, he told stories about his mother and when she was 17, she got pregnant, and her mother said, we gotta do something about this, because she was worried about what the church would think. So they considered abortion. 
and they said if you sat in the choir, you, you couldn't go until after that baby bump was gone and maybe you could go and then you have to hide the baby. And I'm thinking, God, these, we acted like that? That was us? And so when children see that, they see in their words something that's not authentic. They think it's not real. They're like, when people make mistakes, you cast them out? Does that mean you've never made a mistake? This is what I'm trying to now think like a child or like a young person. What is it about? A young person can love God but not love the church. And I'm saying, God, we are your church. Why is there this dichotomy? I see young people worshiping. I see them worshiping the Jonathan McReynolds, and it moves my spirit. But they're in a dark place. It looks like a club, but it's not a club. They're worshiping God. I worship with them. But are they welcome in the church? New Covenant say, yes, they're welcome. Yes, they are welcome. Man looks on the outside, but God looks on the heart. And I believe that if we're going to reach that generation, we've got to shift some things. And we've got to see them as God sees them. And I'm telling you, I saw a blessed young man who's going to bless the world. I'm saying this because I want you to pray for him also. He's starting a foundation, and it's called Will Flow. Will Flo is his mother and his father's name. His mother's name is Florence, I believe, his father, Willie Moe Sr. Willie Moe Sr. And so we prayed and we said, every dream you have will flow. It will flow. We were able to speak prophetically into his life and we believe it is so, and so it is. So children, the expression of children, what was Jesus trying to get us to understand? They see through the eyes of innocence. And he's saying, that's what I want my people to be like. That's what the kingdom of, is like. The kingdom doesn't come by observation. It is in you. And so my next story is my youngest son, David. He's in the room. I'm not going to embarrass you, David. I promise you. At least not intentionally. <laughs> So when I would go to work in the morning, not a morning would pass. I would leave early. I would hear feet running down the stairs, boom, because he would hear the garage door opening. He would say, Dad, have a good day. And he would want to hug me. And he would hug me. And I would hug him. And I would leave with a warm heart. But one day I was packing and about to go on a trip. And he said, Dad, do you work just for money? Do you work just for money? And I said, no, David, I work for you and Mom and Sherelle and Dion, which was a nice spiritual answer. <laughs> but God has wired me to be reflective. And as I reflected on that, I realized what he was really after. Because he said something. He said, Dad, we have enough money. We have, a we have a nice house. We have cars. Why are you working so hard? And what I realized is what he was saying is, I want you. I don't leave me, Dad. I need your presence. And let me tell you how that is like God. God is saying, I want you to want me. I want you just to want my presence, not what I have, not what I have. God wants us to get to a point to say, God, you've given me enough. I just want you. That's what it means to be like a little child. I want you. Your presence is more important to me than anything else. Daddy, if you don't make another dollar, I want you just be with me. Just come to my games. Just be here, be around the house so I can talk to you. Help me with my homework. And now I don't leave before he goes to school. I now, these days, he goes out before I do because I heard the voice of that child. We are God's children. And you know how that made me feel as a parent? 
God feels that way when we desire him more than what he has. And you know how God feels when all we want. Now, I have some people in my life, I think they like me, but they always want something. They hit me up with a text when they want something. And what they want always is money. It's 100% of the time. And it's not that I'm not willing to give it to them, but when that's all it is, it's shallow. It's hollow. It has nothing to do with a relationship with me. I would give you out of the relationship, out of the abundance of the heart, but it's piercing, it's painful when it's about something that has nothing to do with you. And what Jesus is saying is, when children come, it's all about you. They're not, their eyes are single. It's not about those things. And so if you are going to enter this kingdom, that's what you must become like. That's what you must become like. You've got to say, I just want you and nothing else. If you got this, say amen. amen. If you're getting this, say amen again. Amen. So then Jesus in verse 4 says, Therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So now he finally answers the question. You want to be greatest? Be humble like a child. They were asking the question like a boss. Who's going to be the greatest? I'm, I'm, I want to be the greatest. One day, the sons of thunder's mother said, when you get in your kingdom, I want my sons to sit on your right and your left. Jesus said, you understand what you're asking? <laughs> this cup is bitter. I know it looks sweet, but it's bitter. And he said, it's not mine to give, but it's my father's. But what he told them in the end is, look, no, what is that to you? Just follow me. Just follow me. That's what children do. They hear the voice of authority and they follow it. Now, there are some children who don't have a voice of authority in their, in their lives. And there's about 5,000 of them in Philadelphia. And when that happens, they lose their innocence too soon. They lose their innocence and they go astray and bad things happen to them and they do bad things. And there are environments where things are spoken into their life that bring forth death and not life. But I like something about 5,000 because Jesus once was confronted with 5,000 and they had a dire need. And it looked like to his disciples, there's no way this need can be met. And he said, what do you have? And he's saying to somebody right now, whatever resources you have, I can break off something. It don't take much. There were 5,000 who were in need, and he took two fish, five loaves, and broke it off. Somebody said he can break off something. And after it was broken and multiplied so much, we lost count. We don't even know how much it was. All we know is there were 12 fragments that were left. You can't tell me how many was in each fragment. That's what he does. When he takes something in his hands and breaks it, it multiplies. And that's what he's prepared to do for these children. These children who are in unstable environments, these children who he's called, and they're not even in the midst. He called the children, and he set them in the midst of them, of them who know him, who are around him. There's a movement of people who have charitable hearts, but they're not in the midst of him. I want to appeal to the people of God. I believe it's the heart of God for those children to be where he is because he called them to himself and he set them in the midst of them who are them somebody say I am them <laughs> and it doesn't mean that everybody has to do the same thing there are godparents 
There are people who help. There are people who support. Jesus had no children. He was single. But you find me on the face of the earth, a greater advocate for children. We all can advocate for children, for what they need, better education, good housing. All those things matter to God. They matter to God, and I want to submit to you that spiritual. That's what the church does. That because God cares about those things. When Jesus taught about the kingdom, he says, your father knows that you have need of all these things. But seek first, and all this stuff, I'll add it to you. I'll add it to you. You don't have to chase it. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to take thought for it. I will add it to you. I'm going to add it to you. And when we do what the Bible says, God will multiply our seed for sowing. James said it this way, true religion and undefiled before the Father is this, to care for the widows and the orph orphans. He's saying, I know you have a type of a form of religion, but I want you to know what true religion is. To the young people, true religion is not a type of jeans. It's not clothing. True religion and undefiled is this before the Father. When we care for the widows and children, one of the things I learned early in my walk with him is that he cared about that. And so I be life beyond anything that I could believe, not because of anything I've done or anything I've accomplished, but because you obeyed me, son, now I'm going to add to you. And the same thing with children. Denise and I, our whole life, we've taken care of children in our families who were neglected. God would send us and we would bless them. Their first haircut with us. They would go to church with us. We would take them to Central Park. We would do all those things. And we did more for them than their parents. Their parents were younger than us. And now I look back and I see why God gave us that intensity in some cases. Because one of them who we did this for got shot down in the streets at a young age. I had to preach his funeral. A decade later, his mother died. But as I preached her funeral also, I had no regrets because I obeyed God in everything in their life. I expected both of them to outlive me. But while they were here, I did what God said to do. And when you've done that, and when you've been poured out on the altar of sacrifice, there's the kind of sat satisfaction that you can't find anywhere else. I promise you, rich people who are selfish are not fulfilled. I don't care how it looks, you, they're not fulfilled inside because that's not the way God works. That's not the way God works. Little children. He then goes on to say the offense of a child. If you cause one of these little ones one, that believe in me to sin, that's the responsibility of a caregiver. You don't want to cause them to do it. Our job is to prevent them from doing it. And Jesus is telling them, if you cause this, you're better off tying a millstone. You know how heavy a millstone is? Tie it not around your hand, not around your feet, around your neck. When you put that millstone around and cast yourself in, the water isn't your biggest problem. <laughs> Probably before you hit the water, you, your oxygen is going to be gone. He's making a point. He's saying, do not do this. Do not do this. This is how precious children are to me. I value them. Lord, why do you value children? Because I value all who are vulnerable. All who are vulnerable. The reason widows and children are important to them, him is because they're vulnerable and they need a covering. They need protection. If a child comes out of the womb and the mother and father leaves him, does that child have any hope? The only hope is that someone else will come and take that child up. The child cannot do for themselves. And so Jesus, who was single and who had no children, 
gives us the importance in the heart of God, in the mind of God, of every child. And that's why we decided to commit ourselves as a church to doing more for children. It's not just good for the ministry. It's good for the community. It's good for the future. Because if children continue to grow up and the voice that they hear of authority is a voice that causes them to sin, that causes them to be hard, that causes them to do things that they end up with their life wasted in jail. I heard a story. I heard a story, Xavier, about a family which caused the Amachi program to be birthed. How many people have heard of the Amachi program? It was birthed because one day Mayor Wilson Good was in a prison and he was giving a talk and a young man came up to him. He met his father and his grandfather for the first time in prison. For the first time he met them in prison. And so the grandson caught him as he was leaving. He said, can I ask you a question? He said, I, I really was impressed by your talk, but do you think I'll meet my son in here also? And he said, after that, he knew something had to happen. There are certain events that God triggers that causes action. And I pray that for us, this is that trigger. And when I heard that story, I said, that means a couple things. That means he has a son. And that means he doesn't know him. Because if he didn't, if that weren't the case, he wouldn't ask that question. So then it made me realize that there are cycles that have to be broken. And if in that family they don't have the power to do it, God's going to send someone who's violent in the kingdom to break that cycle. Who knows what Willie Moore Jr.'s life would have been like if he didn't have the parents who had him. What he realizes now that he knows God, that he was chosen. And he said, every time I'm down and every time I feel despondent, I remember the words that my father, Willie Moore Sr. said to me. He said, you are my supernatural son. I chose you. There were other children I could have selected, but you are chosen. And Willie Moore said, I think of that and I realize I can do anything, anything. Another thing that happens was one, one of my personal greatest fears. He said he was 17 years old and he was talking to his mother. And he said to her, I wish, I wish that I had my real mother. He said he said it, then he jumped. <laughs> I wish that I had my real mother. And she said, I wish that you had your real mother too, because then you will learn that no mother can love you as much as I love you. And there were wet faces all in this sanctuary. And he, she said, I knew one day that you would do that and that it would hurt my heart. But I want you to know I laid it all on the line for you. Willie Moore Jr., I love you. I stopped going to the club for you. I stopped. I cut off everything because of you. I love you. He said from that moment, that never entered his mind again. And so he told us that for the reason I'm telling you. There are times that challenges will come. But we don't throw our hands up and holler when challenges come because love is greater than any challenge. Love covers a multitude of sins and faults. Love is covering us right now. If you know that's right, somebody say amen. 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 While Pastor Barlow is laying on her hand, the Spirit is leading for all of us to participate. I want you to say with me to these children, you are smart. You are smart. You are intelligent. You are intelligent. Nothing, Nothing is, beyond your is beyond your capability. You can do 
you can do whatever, whatever you desire. You desire. You can do all things. You can do all things through, Christ, through Christ, who strengthens you. Strengthens you. You shall. You shall declare. Declare your generation. Your generation. Come on, let's say it louder. You shall, you shall declare, declare your generation. Your generation. You are different. You are different because, because you've been set apart. You've been set apart. Don't worry about. Don't worry about fitting in. Fitting in. Your purpose. Your purpose is to lead. And not to follow. And not to follow. Be a leader. Be a leader. You are a leader. You are a leader. You are blessed. You are blessed. You are above. You are above. And not beneath. And not beneath. You are beautiful. You are beautiful. You are love. You are love. You are precious. You are precious. You are precious. You are precious. You are more precious. You are more precious than gold. Than gold. And we. We love you. Love you. We support you. Support you. We embrace. We embrace your expression. Your expression. Somebody give God a hand clap.